In this video, we're gonna talk about how waves and specifically light waves can interact with the different boundaries that exist. Uh, our topic today is reflection and refraction. Now, both of these can actually occur for sound waves as well, but the most common examples that you think of are typically gonna be light waves. So we're gonna use that as our model uh, to understand this concept. Now, reflection in terms of light is when light bounces off of something. And the most common example of this is looking in a mirror, you see your reflection there. Um, but reflection can also happen with sound. We, we just call that an echo. Uh, reflection can be quantified through angles um, relative to how it's bouncing on that surface. So first, we will always have an angle of incidence. This is the light that's coming into the, the surface here, that reflective surface. And we then have an angle of reflection. Now, the way it bounces is, as you would expect, just conceptually, you're kind of your gut feeling on that. But we can quantify that as well, according to this normal line here. Earlier in this year, we talked about a normal reaction force, and the normal there was a mathematical term indicating that it was perpendicular to the surface. So the normal line, when we talk about reflection, is the line that's perpendicular to that surface. We're gonna measure the angle of incidence and reflection off of that normal line. So it's tempting to, to take the angle relative to the surface itself, um, but that's not how we are going to be defining that um, for reflection and then for refraction. And I'm using hash marks here to show that these angles are always equal to each other. And if you have a steeper angle, uh, of incidence, we'll have a steeper, ang steeper angle of reflection, and same thing for a shallower angle. Um, these angles with the normal line will always be the same. And because of that, if you're trying to see an object like this tree, in order for it to get to your eye, it needs to bounce off of a surface uh, with that law of reflection enacted, where the angle, according to the normal line, is always the same. Now, in this situation, you probably know that you're looking at the tree through the mirror, but your eye, the way it's interpreting that, only knows that the light is coming from a particular location. Uh, it doesn't know what happened to the light in the process. You know that you're looking through a mirror because you can see the other parts of the mirror. Um, but reality, what your brain is interpreting is some image as if that light ray were coming straight the entire time, that it had not been interacted with, it didn't bounce, it didn't bend, and instead the image that you see is known as a virtual image. It exists somewhere beyond the mirror. If you're looking at yourself in a mirror, your virtual image is twice the distance of you to the mirror. It's like you're, there's a second version of yourself on the other side of the mirror uh, looking back. That virtual image is what would happen if you continue drawing that line. Um, that's where you're seeing that part of the object. Now, using this idea of a law of reflection, I'd like you to look at this picture here and predict, would this person be able to see their feet in the mirror? Assuming that they are not gonna do anything crazy like jump up that in the air or lift their feet up, if they're looking at the lowest point on this mirror, the law of reflection states that it's only gonna get to like their thigh, that they're not gonna be able to see their feet because it can't bounce like this because uh, that angle would not match the angle of incidence. Um, and again, this feels like common sense, uh, but it is useful to quantify and make these things official as well. Another side effect of this uh, that I think is really fascinating is a full length mirror doesn't actually have to be full length. When I say full length, I mean a mirror that you can see your entire body when you're standing in. It does not have to be the same height as your entire body. Um, if I was standing here and wanted to see the top of my top hat, I would just need to look at a point on the mirror that's halfway between my eye and my top hat because it will bounce, that angle will be equal, and will bisect that total distance. And the same thing with my feet. If I want to find my feet there, uh, it'll bounce all the way down to my feet. Now, here's a good question. Predict. If this here is the only mirror that you need if you're standing at this location, if you moved backward, would you need more mirror, less mirror, or the same amount of mirror in order to see your full body? This doesn't feel super intuitive because when you look, when you move backward, you become smaller in the mirror, but that doesn't really tell you anything about the size of the mirror that's required. So let's try that. Let's move this person backward and try the same thing to see the top of his top hat 
needs to bisect that distance between his eyes and his top hat. Same thing with his feet. Notice how the light is bouncing at the exact same extremes on the mirror. So the same mirror size is required for any placement of any distance um, that you can get the smallest possible mirror, which would end up being exactly half of your total height. Um, and then if you place it perfectly, it doesn't matter where you're standing, you'll always be able to see your full image uh, in that mirror as long as you're not doing anything like jumping or uh, the mirror isn't angled or sloped in some way. And not every surface is a flat mirror. Um, if you feel the table that you're currently sitting at or a table nearby, that is a flat surface. But if I look at the table that's uh, in front of me, I can't see my reflection in that because it is not a perfect mirrored surface that the, the different rays of light aren't all bouncing exactly the same uh, in a parallel form. Instead, there is texture, even though it's flat, it's not perfectly smooth. So that texture requires um, these different light rays to bounce a little bit differently because the normal line is different uh, depending on where the perpendicular is to that point on the table. We call this diffuse reflection. Um, and diffuse reflection is how you see everything around you. If there wasn't any reflection at all, it would essentially be this um, black body resonator or black body absorber that you wouldn't see it at all. It would absorb all the light. Um, so everything, if you look around that you see is light bouncing off. It's just not bouncing off as a mirrored surface. So you're not seeing a reflection, but you are seeing the object because that light is entering your eyes. The final example that I want to share about reflection, because it's a fairly simple concept, is uh, a way that you can produce something that's called a retro reflector. Uh, a retro reflective mirror is just two mirrored surfaces that are perpendicular to each other. If you want to make one that's in 3D, you have a third, so it's like the inside corner of a cube. Now, if I send a light ray here, it actually bounces twice. Each time it bounces follows the law of reflection. Um, so the incident and the reflected angle are equal. And notice here, it bounces in, bounce, bounce, and then leaves at exactly a parallel ray to the way it came in. If I fire from a different location, I see the same thing. That means that wherever you're at and you shine a light on this mirror, the light will always come back at you, which is very different than a standard mirror. Standard mirror, if you looked at this sort of reflector, if you shine a light, that light's just going to bounce off this way. That's not where you are. You're not going to see that reflected light. And instead, here, it comes back right at you. This feels like a weird extra application, but it's a really important tool um, to make things reflective. Uh, most street signs are covered in a retro reflective surface. You might have a reflector on your bike. There are actually some reflector, retro reflectors on the moon that have allowed us to measure the distance uh, from Earth to the moon by bouncing lasers off the surface, uh, this retro reflector that was left for the Apollo missions. Uh, and it comes right back where it started so that you can measure, um, measure that light ray coming back in. All right, so all of that is reflection. Now let's shift gears and talk about refraction. Um, those words sound pretty similar, but uh, in practice, they're actually pretty different. Refraction is not the bouncing of light like reflection is. Refraction is the bending of light. Refraction is when light bends uh, because of a change in medium. So if you've ever seen a straw inside a glass and it looks broken, it's because the light was bending as it was going through the glass and the water and you saw the straw in a different way. Same thing, a prism will bend light um, and wavelengths, different wavelengths of light bend differently, uh, which allows a prism to split white light into a rainbow. And for the record, Refraction can happen for sound as well. It's just less commonly talked about uh, because we typically don't have the same sort of uh, medium change. Uh, but if there was a temperature differential, high and low, sound can bend as well because the speed of sound changes uh, in hot air or cold air. So the reason that a medium is able to change the, the direction of light is because the, the speed of light changes there as well. And this is one great way for us to understand it, that in a vacuum, all electromagnetic waves travel at this speed limit of the universe, the speed of light, which we will take as 3.0 times 10 to the eighth 
meters per second. Um, but light slows down through different mediums. So if we are looking at air, light is almost exactly the same as what we saw there, 2.999 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So close enough that we'll typically just round it to that three. Uh, in water though, it's significantly slower, 2.256, and in glass it's slower still. And these different speeds will result in what we call an index of refraction. Index of refraction is a ratio that compares how fast light is traveling um, to the speed limit of light. How the fastest light can travel is through a vacuum. So we're gonna call that one, that index of refraction being one. This is kind of our comparison. We're comparing to that index, that value. Um, index of refraction will give the symbol N and N is a unitless number, it's just a ratio. And the way that we can describe N for other materials is by comparing the ratio of the velocities. So for example, if we're gonna say that medium one is a vacuum and medium two is glass, um, we can compare using this relationship here, N1 over N2, the index of refraction is equal to V2 over V1. So notice how they flip there. Um, I've assigned uh, my medium one to vacuum. So N1 is gonna be one. That's our relative comparison point. Uh, V1 is gonna be this 3.0 times 10 to the eighth. Uh, V2 is gonna be the speed of light in glass here. And then all that's left for us to do is to solve for N2. Notice that the speed of light in glass is less than the speed of light in a vacuum. So this fraction here, this ratio is less than one, which means that N2 has to be larger than one. One turns out is actually gonna be our lowest index of refraction. We're not gonna get an index, index of refraction smaller than one. So in this case, if I solve that through, I find that the index of refraction for glass is about 1.52. Um, if I do the same thing for water, which doesn't move quite as slowly as glass, we get an index of refraction somewhere in between, 1.33. And air, um, because it moves so close to the same speed as in a vacuum, we get like 1.0003. That's close enough to one for us. So we are just gonna say that in air, the index of refraction is one. That's, that's plenty of precision for what we need. So let's try this in a different example. Cubic, cubic zirconia is uh, like a fake diamond. Uh, you see that used in a lot of jewelry. And that has an index of refraction of 2.15. So if we know that the speed of light index of refraction of one is gonna have a velocity of 3.00 times 10 to the eighth, what would the velocity of light be in cubic zirconia? We know it has to be slower than the speed of light, and we can use this relationship one over 2.15 times the speed of light. We end up with 1.40 times 10 to the eighth. Uh, notice that this is even slower still because its index of refraction is even farther away from one. So light travels even slower through cubic zirconia than it does through glass, which is one of the reasons we'll get into uh, total internal reflection in the next video, but it's one of the reasons that this makes a great gemstone uh, and makes those nice colors. It makes it very, very sparkly. It's because of that index of refraction. All right, the last piece that we're gonna talk about in this particular video is how you can predict which way it's going to bend. Um, so here I've got a, a light ray that's entering from air and going into water. That's 1.33. That's the only reason I know that that's water. Um, so through air, light travels a lot faster and through water, light travels slower. The best way that I have found to predict the way that this bends is to imagine this two-wheeled cart that's traveling through. And if you want, you can imagine that you're pushing that two-wheeled cart through um, uh, something that travels faster like the driveway into something that's slower like mud or the grass. And since you're hitting an angle, one of these wheels hits first. Um, so if I animate this in here, the wheel that hits first slows down while the other wheel keeps going at the same speed. Let's watch that again. Notice when that wheel on the, uh, this part here slows down, it causes the whole thing to bend until that other wheel hits the new surface as well. 
Um, and then that is the direction that it will continue. It's not going to continue bending. It'll go as a straight line once they're both in that new medium. It will always bend toward the optically dense, the most optically dense medium's normal line. So in this case, it bends towards that normal line going from air to water. If I flip this around and I'm going from water to air, um, the same strategy can be used. Imagine that you're pushing that two wheeled cart out of the mud and onto a driveway. One of the wheels gets to the driveway, the faster surface first, and then turns away from that, that location. You will always bend away from the least optically, optically dense mediums, normal line. So, just like we saw in the opposite, uh, in this case, we're bending away because that is the side that reaches first. So how much do these bend? The relationship between the index of refraction and the amount that light bends uh, is really important. And it's always a relative thing. So if I have something going from air into something more optically dense, the bigger the difference, the more the bend. So in this case, if I'm going into water, I will bend because one and 1.33 are different. And the amount of difference will give me how much the bend is. If I go through something more optically dense like glass, I'm gonna bend even more. So air and glass have an even larger difference in their index of refraction. So that results in an even larger bend. The larger the difference, the larger the bend. Next video, we're going to talk about how you can actually quantify this and figure out the exact angle. But right now, um, it's important to conceptually know what to expect as well. If I have something going out, uh, I, I remember I bend away from that least optically dense normal line, uh, and water to air, I bend like this. If I uh, have the same index or the same incident angle, through glass instead, I'm just going to bend more on the way out. So again, the, the larger the difference, the more the bend. You can see this um, going the opposite direction as well. The smaller the difference, the smaller the bend. So I'm happy to introduce the very first bedtime science episode with my daughter and myself uh, starting right now. We're going to look at something of bedtime science we're going to look at something called the index of refraction Callie inside this cup is something called canola oil can you say canola oil <laughs> yeah great job so inside that canola oil I put a test tube that's made out of pyrex glass and inside the test tube is just air right now there is a medium change as it goes from the canola oil to the test tube glass to the air and then back out and whenever it changes it bends. Can you show me what bend looks like with your hands? Yeah. So what we're going to do is we are going to fill this test tube with some more canola oil. The crazy thing about canola oil is it has the same index of refraction as the Pyrex glass. That means that light travels just as fast through canola oil as it does through Pyrex. All right, Callie, do you want to watch the special magic trick? All right, I want you to watch the Pyrex test tube in there and we're gonna make it disappear if we pour canola oil inside we make that medium change not nearly as abrupt Kelly is the test tube there or is it gone uh. it looks like it's gone because the index refraction of the canola oil is the same as the test tube so the light doesn't bend when it travels through both all right Kelly can you say join us next time on bedtime science <laughs> All right, see you later. Good job, Callie. Yeah. All right, so to wrap things up here, the takeaways from this lesson is you should be able to identify the angle of incidence and angle of reflection for a reflected wave ray and use that to predict how light is going to bounce off of a mirror. You should also be able to relate the index of refraction to how fast light travels through that medium and use that to qualitatively predict how light bends
transitioning between these medium boundaries. Um, in our next video, we will quantitatively figure this out and compare those angles and then get a little bit more advanced in this idea of refraction and some other things that could happen along the way.